Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I'm the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Art Talk. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. I am personally grateful to call the Pacific Northwest my home, and I'm thankful to the Coast Salish communities that continue to protect the natural beauty and animal diversity that surround me every day. It has been my great pleasure to work with Hilary Letwin and her guest tonight to bring this event to your screens. And now I'd like to pass things over to Hilary, who's waiting over at the museum. Hilary? Thank you, Taryn. We're so delighted to be partnering with West Vancouver Memorial Library to present this artist talk this evening. I'm joined here by Ross Penhall, uh, who of course is the exhibiting artist in our current exhibition, Losing Control of the Landscape, which is here at the West Vancouver Art Museum until December 16th, so please come and see it. Ross, uh, thank you. It's so nice to get together and have an opportunity to chat about this particular exhibition. Yes. Uh, so we've been working towards this project for almost the last two years or so. We've been talking about the exhibition. Uh, and um, we were really, from the beginning, very certain that we wanted to show something a little bit different, a little bit surprising. Uh, we wanted to include your new work, we had the opportunity to include some older work, and we definitely lasered in on the, on the new work. Which is yes, you did. Here. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, what you've been up to for the last few years. There are some things that you're doing a little differently. So let's, let's talk about your COVID experience and, and what you've been doing a little differently. Well, yeah, COVID, I mean, let's start there. It, um, so it was, Nothing changed really. I just went to my studio every day. I mean, it was isolation is what I'm really good at. Mm -hmm. So, or isolating, and um, and yeah, it was uh, it was an inspirational time. It sounds terrible to say, but because I know that many people suffer, but I, I I'm lucky to have that outlet, and I just went to my studio by myself and worked. And um, things did come to a grinding halt. The galleries, obviously, but uh, but. Um, you know, it just, it was almost kind of freeing in a way. Like, I felt the pressure just off, and I was able to just, just work. And without anything in mind, really, just work. And, and then, you know, with the outdoor painting, the uh, winter, it's been a huge boost for me as far as creativity and not being precious with, precious with imagery and just getting out there and um, doing with friends and by myself. Uh, I like it by myself. I, I mostly do it when I travel, and, and so that's new. And you know, a little less um, you know sketching with pencil, more like on my iPad and working out compositional issues um, with small paintings. And I, I sort of confine myself to three sizes: eight by eight, eight by eight, eight by ten, and six by twelve, and that kind of covers everything. So I, I will shoehorn imagery into those, and um, or just change it completely, <laughs> and uh, so that's been good. It's 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 a little daunting. It's not for everybody, but because um, um, when you do stand out in the middle of a field or wherever, you it's like it it is overwhelming, and you have to sort of focus in, and you have to sort of pick. It was one trip I was on. I just pulled off the one hundred and one, and said, "I have no idea what's at this turn off. I'm just going to find something, even if I, all I do is just color match." You know the, the the dry grass and those sorts of uh, possibilities, and that you know. And after I did that, I got back in the van. I felt I felt so good. Like most of my moves are <laughs> dictated by my art. Like and, and whether I'm feeling like I'm moving forward or or just if I can get something done in the morning, my whole day looks better because it's everything I it's kind of defines me. Because you touched on the small words, uh, I'd like to clarify for our audience that we have a number of your sort of signature large-scale canvases in the mm -hmm. exhibition, some of which you can see right here. Um, 
but we also have a number of these small panels, these new small panels. And this is more or less the first time that you've exhibited these small panels. So this is something a little bit new. Um, I, I would, yes. I mean, I've, I've been showing them in California um, starting uh, in the last couple of years, I would say. You know, um, I've been approaching it slowly, and I finally figured out how I like to do it and how I apply paint to these little panels, and they're coming together. So yeah, I'm, I'm more and more confident about showing them. And, and they're and just, too. for the sake of clarity, they're, they're absolute small gems. They're, mm -hmm. they're beautiful. They hold just as much power as the large-scale landscapes do. Um, I would argue maybe even more. There's something that really draws you into these small there, there is that. Um, there for sure. I, you know, uh, people often say about like the group of seven who did a lot of, you know, they tear the lids off cigar boxes and and, uh, and paint on those and, 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 and preparatory things and, and leaving areas uncovered and um, and it, yeah, they were loose and thick and spontaneous and that's what the small ones are. You, you can't help it. Like you're not, you don't get precious. You get in. You know, sometimes they take an hour. You know. Um, some, I can go back and work on them a bit afterwards, but um, yeah, it's about it's about making quick decisions and laying down your tunnel values and getting it done. Now, I always, but when when they take that same image and paint it big, it, unless you're going to paint with brushes, maybe this big, group the paint on the paint exactly like you did on the small one. I don't I don't know if you could capture it. I, it's it's hard. Everything gets tighter, yeah. but that's okay. It's it's all right. It's it's a whole different thing, but uh, but there is a a looseness, and I think it's, it's starting to translate into larger work too. Mm -hmm. A little bit more. Yeah. So, so our <clears throat> title, "Losing Control of the Landscape," is a little bit around you actually loosening control yes. over your painting. Yes, and, and yeah, and trying to yeah, losing control. Yes, um, giving up control. I mean, you, assuming you ever had it, <laughs> you know, which is a, <laughs> uh, yeah. So I think because every time I start a game, whether it's a small or big one, I, it's just a leap of faith. And I, and I, I feel like I'm um, doing it for the first time. And, and it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, when you think after all these years, I like have it down, but I, you know, it, it's starting a painting is hard for me. And that's mostly it's hard. But once I get going, <laughs> it's funny. But, uh, and then finishing them is not a problem. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't think all the way through. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm mixing paint on the canvas. I'm, I'm just, you know, whether it's putting a cloud in a perfectly perfect sky you've just done, you, know, you, you, know, you could just screw it all up by um, putting in a, the wrong cloud. Or is this convincing? I don't know. You know, so you, you know, I mean, lots of leaping faith, of leaping faith. Lots of that. <clears throat> yeah. um, you mentioned your seven, so let's dig a little bit into your influences, your artistic influences. Yeah. Uh, you you are very quick to list a long list of people mm -hmm. uh, who, who you draw inspiration from. Yes. So I'd like to just touch on some of those people. Uh, we've spoken about it before, mm -hmm. but perhaps for the sake of our audience, you can touch on a few and just talk about um, about how different arts influence you in different ways. Um, well, I, I guess to, to, to deny my influence of the seven would be silly. Um, would be insincere. I, 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 they are there, but I realized after thinking about it, and Robert Heffel giving me one of A.J. Kasson's books, which I had years ago, mm -hmm. um, and he just said, here, take this. And so I got a new one. It's quite a collection. And I, I, uh, I started going through it and realizing, this is the guy. Mm -hmm. It's not the group set. It's mm -hmm. actually A.J. Kasson. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, I realized, I forgot how much of an influence he was in the mm. You know, to the point where I did go meet him. I did go to his house. And, uh, so you, you wrote a letter to him? I, 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 no, I just looked him up in the phone book. <laughs> it's wrong in the phone book. I had a friend and I like, oh, we're talking on the phone. And I said, you know, is, is AJ Cass in the phone book? She goes, oh well, yeah, here he is. I said, hey, really? give me his number. And this was like before the internet. This is, yeah, early 90s or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I called him up and, and uh, spoke to his daughter and his daughter said, yeah, come on. So you, you went for a visit with I went for a visit. And you know, just like visiting your grandma. He was in his 90s? Yeah, late, yeah, late, late 90s, yeah. He died, I think, a year. No, no. 
too far out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, it was, yeah, so going back to that, I realized his use is uh, the lobby of this, I love. Our, we're all commercial artists. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they have their sense of design and, and things like that. So I, I, and I was too for a short period of time. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate their sen sensibilities to design, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, their light and dark and shadows. Uh, you know how they play with landscape. Yeah, AJ Casson. So Edward Hopper said. And oh yeah, Hopper too. Yeah, he's he's pretty big. Um, he, I think, from him, his etching, he was amazing at sure. Uh, so I've always uh, loved his etchings. His look, his you know, contrast, light and dark. You know, his his uh, moody piece, uh, amazing. Um, and just his the way he crops. And um, yeah, just a simple way he's, he's, he's a bit cheap on the paint, like he scrubs his paint on. He was a funny guy. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, he was a real grump. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, he, he painted the loneliness of New York. And, and again, his light shadow, like how he would repeat light, dark, you know, he would place things. Everything was very well thought of. And he was a commercial artist too, so mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I went to his 1995 show, the old Whitney, and then just last November, I yeah. went to see his, uh, his new show at the Whitney, at the Whitney. And his, all his etchings were there, so that was, it was, they moved me more than his paintings, actually. So I'd like to talk a little bit about your printmaking, because mm -hmm. we, we're very fortunate we are currently selling uh, one of your prints as part of our Artist mm -hmm. Editions program. Thank you very much for that, uh, which means that, that we keep the proceeds of all of the sales, so that's incredible support for us. So let's talk a little bit about your printmaking because uh, you, one could even say that you started off doing drawing and works on paper and prints mm -hmm. even before you started painting. Oh, in earnest. Way before. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit about your printmaking. Uh, you don't make prints all the time now, you, the majority of your time is spent painting. Yes. Uh, but let's talk about how you got into printmaking and, and what you like about it. And it, I think it's really important to clarify that, that your prints look very different from your paintings, yes. almost in the same way that, that poppers do. So mm -hmm. let's let's talk about that. What do you love about printmaking? Well, I loved it like, right from when I went to Cap College. My, my um, high school art teacher, Fred Duell, um, at Hillside, he, he introduced us to copper, or no, zinc plates, and acetate, we could draw into uh, clear acetate, and we were pulling prints from that. And then when I went to Cap College, Wayne Eastcott was my printmaking teacher there, and, you know, he really encouraged me, and I, I and then I, I um, kind of carried on and then went, joined Malastina you know, Printmaking in Grand Island, and, mm -hmm. you know, they, you know, you have to show a competency, which I had, and, uh, and they give you a locker, and, and you can go into the studio anytime. Um, day or night and you just work and I, I was just, I was so happy back then I wasn't interested in anything other than just fulfilling that part of my creativity you know sales were another thing it was just it was nothing it was just going there spending a whole day there and, uh, and coming away just and then go do a night shift at the fire hall or you know um, so this would have been yeah the early 80s mm -hmm. Granville Island had just sort of got going and it was, it was a wonderful experience and then so then I and I, and I got really good at it I mean um and I look back on some of the things I'm like, because I uh, I don't I don't do it as much now. But I, I um, you know once a year I could throw up and once a year I go in and work with Peter. It's usually around Christmas. I go in and pull some proofs and, and uh, it was always a nice distraction to get out of the studio. So, mm -hmm. so Peter at New Leaf, he's New Leaf Editions. So he he's the master printmaker. I I work with the plate and then he proofs it for me. So mm -hmm. it, because printmaking in itself is, a, is an art form. You're actually wiping the plate and you know, getting the pressure right. You know. and I, was, I got quite good at it, but it's just another thing, another level, a layer that I don't have time for. Mm -hmm. rather be, <clears throat> I'd rather be a uh, mm -hmm. So it's a good distraction to get out of the studio. And, uh, so I, I just, what I like about etching, I just like scratching the plate, and I love the black and white quality, of crisp, mm -hmm. you know, the, the dark, dark line. And I did a lot of drawing, and that was the other thing. So it was printmaking and drawing, graphite and color pencil, and some pastel, and I was just sort of working my way to something. Eventually I knew, oh, I figured if I'm too paint, but 
Because it carried my life. So you have to switch. It's time to switch. So, and I think <clears throat> you took a class in the car? The I took a night class. class. Yeah, I took a night class. And, and uh, I also took a lithography course there, too. Um, that didn't appeal to me. It was uh, drawing on stone. It was, it was just too, too delicate. Um, etching is nice because you can just scratch and you, know, you can pretty much make a mark with anything. That's mm -hmm. part of hand um, But yeah, so I took a painting class with uh, Lucy Hogg at uh, Emily Carr. And I taught, she was very good. Like she, I remember one the thing that stuck with me is, you know, when you're a beginner and you're, you're struggling with material, you just think, oh, I'll just put more paint on it. And eventually she said, Ross, you're just pushing paint around. <laughs> and you just scrape it off. Like, scrape it off, yeah. So, you know, and you know, like that's like, you know, Whistler, um, you know, um, the painter Whistler, he, he would uh, paint for eight hours with his models and then scrape it all off. But there'd be like a halo left and then you bring it start the next day. And so, you know, yeah, so that stuck with me so hard. And, um, and just the routine of doing it. And it really made me figure out whether I wanted acrylic or oil. Mm -hmm. Oil, I completely gravitated to that. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was good. It was a good exercise. Yeah, for the rest, of, everything else has been, like I said, studying other people's work, um, not boring completely, but little aspects like you know, you know Sean Skelly, like, um, his edges are amazing. Same with Wayne Thibault, or Wayne, how he lifts planes and, you know, you know, it's okay to tweak things and make it a little imaginary. And, and, uh, so there's, there's a, yeah, everybody has something, you know, uh, that I borrow from, remind myself, yeah. And, you know, a lot of it's just, you learn to figure out, dry brush and figure it out, like, you know, painting is like your signature, it's how you write and how you make a mark is individual to everybody. So. People ask me, you know, do you want, will you ever teach us? No, no, I will not teach you. I, I don't teach how to paint. I will inspire you. Mm -hmm. And I can sort of guide you with materials, but I'm not going to sit here and critique your work as you paint. I, I wouldn't even, I'm not interested. So let's talk <clears throat> a little bit about some of the digital tools that you use now for your mm -hmm. work, because I think that's one significant change that your work is, that you've sort of uh, embraced mm -hmm. in recent years. And yeah. Uh, it, it does seem quite different from how you used to work. So tell us briefly how you worked pre-digital tools and then tell us how you work now. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I did you know, sketchbooks, stuff, you know, stacks of sketchbooks and, you know, my little carrying pencils and, uh, and, and uh, boxes. And it's not that long ago. I, you know, I had a box of photographs that were just, I'd go through. Sometimes ones that didn't appeal to me and suddenly appealed to me. And you know, I'd be, so I had those, and at that point I wasn't um, um, in their painting yet. Um, so a lot of sketching, a lot of you know, a lot of figuring out, a lot of cropping. That Edward Hopper thing, where you're just like, what, you know, how close does that telephone pole need to be here? And like cropping, and uh, I spent a lot of time prepping before I even get to putting something on the canvas. And then, so I remember going from. I've been in that for so long. Like, I remember sending slides and pictures and down to the galleries in California 22 years ago. You know, it's amazing how long things took. Now, well, with my iPad, I just, I had it, and I had the iPad Pro, and it's just it's the big one, and it has the stylus. And I, I can manipulate, before I ever get to a painting, I can, you know, take these mountains and make them taller. I can squish, I can lengthen, I can do all these things. Um, yeah, I can take a photograph and just introduce all sorts of things that, that interest me, that make it me. The photographs are all yours. They're all mine. That you're working with. Yeah. And then what I also do is when I've done a painting and I've got to a certain point, I'm going, what does it mean? I will, photo, I will enter it into the, um, my St. Brushes app and I will, you know, start monkeying around with removing the mountains, making the clouds, like I can actually, it's such an easy app to work with. It's like painting on, a, on an iPad. And so, you know, uh, David Hockney, you know, he was one of the first people to have a whole show of digital artwork. I mean, yeah, I remember at the De Young in San Francisco, it, it was beyond. Um, and then I think he also had um, 
you could write iPads, you know, all these iPads on the wall would be drawn. I mean, the iPad came with the image, you buy the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, so the, yeah, so the, that has become such a, a tool. It's a tool. Artists are always very good at figuring out tools. And the other thing I want to mention, too, uh, going back to that, is artists have always, painters have also done that, you know, like Leonardo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, like it's over the years, like it's, it was their way of multiples, like mm -hmm. uh, of doing, being able to reproduce. And, you know, and, uh, so that's, I didn't know that when I first started, but I learned that later. It's like, oh, yeah, it's this kind of thing. Oh, yeah, a yeah. huge tool of dissemination. Yeah. For the Renaissance forward. Yeah. Uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit more about how you select your views. It's been interesting. A lot of um, our visitors have come in in recent weeks and wanted to know the exact location mm -hmm. where uh, a painting shows. Yes. Uh, and for the most part, yes, you're manipulating the image, but for the most part, the places that you're painting are real places. Mm -hmm. And um, if one really knew their geography, they could. Pick out most of the right. most of the um, locations, uh, but um, but let's talk a little bit about um, your perspectives. So we, all of the works that we have in the show are, are from photographs, with the exception of the small panels that mm -hmm. we're painting on plein air. Uh, do you? And a lot of these places are are fairly remote places. Mm -hmm. So how how do you what 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 about a particular location makes you think this would be a great picture? What are you looking for when you're, when you're looking for places to paint? Um, well, um, let me just think here. I, I, I tend to, I have to go out and find them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, so I will take something like, um, I'm trying to think, uh, I'm just trying to think of titles, I'm, I'm drawing blanks here, like, like um, Tangled Beach here. Um, that is a friend's place on the here. Mm -hmm. And I get up in the morning and I go out and uh, you know, I sat there. I did, I've done a smaller version of that one. Um, I'm always looking. I'm never not looking. Um, I took a window seat on the plane. I was just in Saskatoon. I made sure I got a window seat because I really wanted to look out. Um, Carry one in the aisle. Okay, you know, so, you know. um, and uh, so I will find, you know, I have friends with boats, I have a little boat, and when we go up the coast, I'm, you know, we head up in early in the morning, and I'm pretty much up on the front of the boat, <laughs> and everything, and I'm seeing, you know, clouds, and I'm seeing all these things, and I'm going, that's a good one, I can work with that. So I will take, like, um, I'm trying to remember the name of that one over there, um, like, I will look at an image and go, this is so great, I, and I'll get little aspects of that, I can work with that. I can work with that, I can make that taller, I can do this, I can swish it a bit, and, but I need a way through because there's no, you're just looking at a blank wall, so I will actually create a gap so that there's, and that may not be true to the location, but everybody's seen, like if you go up the coast, it's, it's very good, it's a thing you see all the time, you mm. gaps, like, oh, should I go through there? Mm. But I like there always to be a way through the work, I don't want to have you know, be stopped. I, I love, uh, in, in something that I read about your work, uh, you, you love that expression, don't get a lamp, don't, don't let a, what was it? Um, don't let a landscape get in the way of a good composition. Yes. Like yeah. 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 Yeah, it's true. Like, you know, and that's, that's the, the heart of it is, you know, art is all about, and I didn't say this, but art is about exaggeration. Art mm -hmm. is about um, taking what's in front of you and making it your own. Mm -hmm. um, nothing wrong with Getting likenesses, but you still, you know, like close, you know, realist painters and that. Um, but I, I still, you still need to put something in you in it. That's one way. There's many ways to do it, but that's the way I do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if it's like I need to feel, I'm looking at this image, I need to make it feel a little more claustrophobic, so I will, you know, exaggerate things, or I, you know, um, you know in the prairie, like in um, the light dusting. Um, that as much as I squish landscapes on the coast this way, I will stretch. Um, and that's another program I found where you don't lose anything. You don't crop anything down, you just squish it. So for instance, like the, um, I, again, you know, I was, 
I took a bunch of pictures out of a window of an aircraft coming into Calgary, and they didn't interest me at the time. You know, and they probably sat in, somewhere in my folder I had for five or six years. And I'm scrolling, and I do that. I scroll back in time. And I go, well, let's, I'll just go back to 2016 and see what I, or even further. And I said, oh, look at these. This, this is very interesting. So, I, so then what I did was, it was actually all recalled by my gallery owner in California. He, he, he thought, this painting is really great, Ross, but it needs to be this wide. And it was another painting. And I thought, oh, so he was the one that actually kind of got me into like, mm. manipulating the image. Mm. It doesn't work with everything. Like, you can't just do a tree and squeak it because suddenly it's like this wide. <laughs> so it, 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 it has its limitations, but you just you have to know if you're pushing it too far. So anyway, with the prairie, it was like, okay, well, you know, we're coming in, say, at uh, 4,000 feet, and you're looking down, and then it, with the squishing program, you just squish it, and suddenly you're at 200 feet. So it just becomes wider, and the whole, just everything becomes, like, uh, well, you know, the laws of perspective, as you get lower to the horizon, you, everything widens. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's really interesting. It's a very horizontal painting. Course. So you've touched on this a little bit, but just for the sake of clarity for our audience, so we've arranged this exhibition according to geographical location. So we have in the first gallery we've got our West Coast views, in the second gallery we've got our mountains That's and our prairie views. It was, yes. That's good. And then in the third gallery we have our East Coast views, uh, and those are paintings of the land. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to just talk about how. Uh, because you've touched on this already, there are different visual tools that you're implementing. There are different visual um, languages that you're implementing according to where in Canada you are depicting. And a good example of this is on the West Coast, your waves and your a lot of your paintings are very long and flat. Mm -hmm. The water is quite, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, flat. And of course, in the East Coast paintings, your waves are quite tall. There's a real verticality to them. Yes. So you're you're still looking at these different places, these different locations, and, and depicting reality. Uh, because in in the East Coast, that's how water appears. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, um, but even with my high paintings, um, back when I went to Fogo, um, I was invited there. In a did a commission for some people that hosted us, my wife and I. And um, just the month before that, I was in, okay, that was I was in Hyde Black. Yes. And uh, so one month later, I was on the extreme west coast of one coast and then the extreme blue of the other coast. Mm. And it, just the similarity. But but when I was out fishing with my daughter, I could see these waves come in. You don't even know the rollers are on. Mm. You're, just, you're just gradually going up and down, and suddenly you see a break. Mm. And um, I didn't paint that coast. I was busy fishing and I was taking photos, but um, I didn't spend a lot of time outside of Hyde Park. I spent more time on the inside. So I've always lived in sort of protected waters. Mm. Like even the painting here, um, <laughs> I'm terrible. Um, but uh, it's it's sheltered, it's sheltered water. So I mean, I live in House Sound. I, I look around. A lot of these, you're right. They're very. The mountains are very. Tall and, and then, but I'm I'm always looking for that sort of anchor at the bottom to sort of yeah, and it is calm. I mean, they are calm. The the one the uh, the Fogo piece was, I mean, all of Fogo Island. It seemed like the whole the whole area around there was in high definition. It just mm -hmm. seemed crisp and sharp, and, and uh, the sun. It was September when we were there, and, uh, and the rocks were dark and sharp. <laughs> and so yeah, it was very. And I, I realizing the more I look at that painting, yeah. That's, that's what I was feeling. The air was fresh and it was just this it's Atlantic, mm -hmm. wild Atlantic. And, you know, so how sound can be treacherous. I mean, the Georgia Strait is one of the most complicated pieces of water on the coast. And there's, there's like three bodies of water coming in all directions. And, and, um, so it, it can be terrible, but I, I, but, but I, I don't know. I just, I, I think I'm. More interested in the mountains and the water is just a, uh, an anchor. Mm -hmm. It's just to make things sit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. <laughs> it does. So you mentioned the word treacherous, and I'd like to dig in a little bit uh, to that. So 
you worked as a firefighter for 29 years here for the District of West Vancouver, uh, and um, that you've said in, in previous instances impacted the fact that you became a uh, leader mm -hmm. uh, and the way in which you've worked. Um, let's talk about about the balance between working as a firefighter mm -hmm. and working as a painter. Sure. Um, you know, I knew I knew at a very young age I, I wanted art in my life. Like I knew that was going to be it. in nineteen. You did. You're not quite sure like what that means, especially back in like, nineteen seventy nine. You know, like, like, you know, it was a different world. I mean, it was, um, and so, but I also knew I wanted freedom. I needed I needed a job. So I thought, well, I'll just I need shift work, and that's I, I, I want large blocks of time off so that I have the freedom to do what I want, and that's. Um, that's why I chose park fighting, and plus I, I like the job. I mean, it, it, it appealed to me. You know, I, I was working at Whistle on the Ski Patrol in the ambulance when I was younger, at, at, around that time, and I was getting a smattering of all this, and, and uh, I joined the West Van you know, Park Department volunteers. They had volunteers way back then. And, um, and I just, I don't know, the idea of showing up and helping, you know, running, when anyone's running that way, you're running this way, I don't know, it just it appealed to my thrill-seeking, thrill you know, Risk-taking <laughs> attitude. I, I, yeah, I have. You know. um, and you know, it, it was completely different than being an artist. Like it was the opposite ends. You know, one is all about the team, and the other one's all about not the team. You see, you spend time by yourself. So after four days in the studio, I'd be like, yeah, I think I need some human contact now. So <laughs> I had this great balance. And, and as far as people go, do you, you know, do you, do you ever paint flyers? And you know, I said, no, not really. No, it doesn't really interest me. But <clears throat> driving around the fire truck, you know, we'd be, I'd be saying, "Hey, you guys, look at that! Look at the light on those clouds!" And they were, <laughs> and they started like, "What color is that, Ross?" And be like, it's, it's, you know, it's a you know, <laughs> cerulean blue, matched with a bit of quinacridone. <laughs> and, like, and so they started to, uh, it was like, yeah, they, they, they were always, yeah. I when I took when, when I took my lithography course. Um, I jokingly said, if you guys want a print, and you want to produce a print for the show, you know, you know, fifty bucks each, and you know, you'll get a print out of it. But I said, you know, sorry, guys, calling from the other halls, and they're all like, <laughs> can you print? Mad, mad, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the, the course is paid for by the firefighters. Amazing. Well, we've never had more firefighters attend an exhibition. Oh, yeah. they? <laughs> <laughs> they were very supportive. They, they were so good. So I, I want to. For our last question, I want to talk about um, what it is to be a landscape artist in the time of climate change. Uh, we're looking at some really significant climate emergencies that are happening here in BC and around the world. And in a way, what we're looking at on the walls here is a catalog of endangered species. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that and, and talk a little bit about um, how you how you tackle questions around climate change? Uh, I think you know these these are these paintings and the felting, which we should mention as well, um, are are really uh, are really an interesting way to look at, at the nature that we want to see preserved in the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, what does it what does it mean to be a landscape artist in the time of climate emergency? Well, it's uh, it's. The climate emergency has crept up on us. Like it's suddenly, like I didn't start out realizing that we were in quite a dire situation. Um, I should have seen it coming. I, I worked in the logging industry when I was a teenager. That was your first job. <clears throat> it was yeah, and it was an eye opener. And uh, I, 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 um, but I'm glad I did it. I mean, I'm glad I did. It taught me a lot about human nature, people, and, and, uh, and then um, I just think here with as far as my painting goes. Like I recently, you know, back in two thousand five, when, when that book came out, the uh, Golden Spurs. I mean, this is part of the show too. I, I um, it, it, it profoundly affected me, but it wasn't until I reread it, or now I re-listened or listened to it. And for some reason, that was even more uh, profound. Um, I, I was almost like uh, 
not PTSD, but I was having flashbacks to my forest days when I was working in the forest. And his description of, of, um, of the, just the logging industry and all that, and just the, I mean, everything he talked about was like, oh yeah, I remember those names, you know, the names of different jobs and choking and chasing and, you know, hookers and, like, they, they were a person, not really hookers. <laughs> they were the, the men, job. The, job. Uh, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and just the, the crazy, you know, these people that work in, in these camps and they, you know, they dump month, two months in the camp and they go out and go back to Vancouver and just lay waste to the downtown east side, which is like, this is terrible. And um, I, I um, so reading this, reading his book, I, I realized, you know, he describes the fact, and then ties in with losing control of the landscape is, you know, the First Nations, and he talks a lot about mostly the Haida, um, and how they lost control of their landscape. You know, they were part of the fur trade. They, you know, according to um, John Donovan, they, they, you know, they, you know, if you can't be in, I guess you got to join. And then they came from Europe, and you know, otter furs were just so coveted. And then the otters ran out, like the buffalo and whatever, you know, other species <laughs> decimated. Um, and then the hider were like, no, we do, you know. Um, and then they came for the forests, and then they came for the fish, and then they came for the minerals. And, and this is what this is John Allen quoting, it's more or less um, paraphrasing. And then, and then, sort of now we're losing control of the landscape, mm -hmm. you know, like so. If assuming we ever had any control, and again, you know, it's like I think the First Nations did have control. I mean, I think they were, you know, might have a lot less, they lived within their means, and they weren't on this mission to deforest. I mean, they came. The only reason why we're slightly behind the East Coast is it just took longer for them to come around. But once they figured it out... For the industry. For the industry. And, and they were looking for these sail masts, you know, at that time. Something like 97% of BC's old growth forest is gone. Mm -hmm. And what we have left, that 3%, is the protected bit. So you, you <coughs> don't paint clear cuts. You don't paint um, no. landscape that, that has been decimated. And, no. and by focusing in on the beauty, we're seeing um, a, a different version of the reality, I think. And I wonder yeah, what's possible, or what, what yeah, I mean, not possible. But, but, you know, a lot of these could be, um, you know, just over the hill, mm -hmm. it could be clear cut. Like, and and you're very good at making you not see yeah. what was just over the hill. And yeah. that's what Grant had when he was going to space, he was so upset. Yeah. There's there's a there's a screen of what we see, yeah. and then all of the curve that happens. Mm -hmm. right. So and you do you have logs that that you have logs in a lot of your paintings. Yeah, and some of them get washed down creeks, you know, from erosion or whatever. And yeah, and some come out of log booms. And I mean, it's it's uh, yeah, fun. Yeah, I find them fascinating. There's a lot of right there. There's a yeah. lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, shelter area. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the coast. I know, the more you learn about the coast, I think every person that lives in British Columbia should, should read that book. Like, mm. It's a permit for just understanding why we're where we are, why we're here. With the foresting With industry. foresting, yeah, for, yeah, a lot of it. Just So you let's talk about your felt from the, oh, the, last, felting, the yes. last minute. So okay. you just started felting. Uh, it's something you do in the evenings to relax, yeah. I think, like yeah. most people. Melting. Uh, so you uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it it uh, it started. It's a long story, I, I won't, <laughs> but my daughter was the first one. Like she's she ties all sorts of fun you know, things, and, and uh, she 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 gives a little dog, and I I um, from that she goes, Dad, you can do this. It's so easy. It's like okay, so of course. And she just she goes, she just poke, you just keep poking and, and then, you know, and so anyway, of course I go on YouTube and try to figure out that and, and then I I discovered Mewa on Grand Island and, and they you know they sell all the wools and all the stuff and you go on Amazon and you, <laughs> you find felting pads and all these things and it just seemed it's it's such a it's like just a way of it's not messy, it's you know, but it's you are you're using your hands and you're just you're just uh, the sound is so relaxing and of course, the first shape I want to make are trees, and uh, and they seem, yeah, they're they're just, it's a challenge. The forms are just you roll them, and then you 
you start poking, and it, it just it, 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 it un, un, unveils itself rather slowly. So the more you poke in an area, it's a, it's a barbed needle, and you push the fibers through, they lock, and then you can create depressions and dimples, and, and you can pretty much add, and cover over, and it's, there's, it's very flexible. Mm. So it's just, um, yeah, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to buy a, a display cabinet, a big one, because <laughs> I don't know what to do with them all. Like, I have like 60 of them now, so <laughs> they're all different colors, and I'll try this color. I mean, it's all dyed natural wool, you know, from New Zealand and Nepal. Uh, I'm looking for a local just source to get there. It's, so. it, look, they're, they're very you. They're very distinctly you. There's no denying their, their authorship. Um, so yeah, see see where the felting takes you. Yeah, and, yeah. With and then there's even by the white felt, then you can actually spray and dye it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I may get into that trend too. And intriguing possibly. <laughs> uh, Ross, thank you so much for speaking with me this evening. It's great to sit down and thank you. chat about the exhibition. This has been great. Uh, we, as I say, the exhibition is on until December sixteenth, and we encourage you to come in and see us. We're open Tuesday to Saturday from eleven a.m. till five p.m. Uh, and we did produce an exhibition for this publication, which is available here for purchase uh, for $30. Uh, and there's a great um, statement by Ross and an essay by me, and uh, we encourage you to come and check that out. So thank you to the library for co-presenting us, uh, co-presenting this this evening. And we look forward to seeing you here soon. Thank you. Thank you.